Okay, thank you very much, Jack. Um, so yeah, so just in, so I'm going to be uh, basically focusing on a scheme that the National Park has been running called Heritage Watch, which doesn't sound like a very creative uh, title, but essentially it's to try and address and mitigate um, heritage crime um, at sites in the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park. And uh, the background I've chosen for this is relevant. So this is Gorsfoud, which I'll mention afterwards, but essentially it's a site that has had some um, issues with uh, related to heritage crime. Um, so yeah, so if I just, so yeah, so I, I work as a community archeologist for the uh, Pembrokeshire Coast National Park. Um, and essentially my role involves focusing on the archaeological and historical sites and features and also more broadly uh, cultural heritage. Um, so the map on the right, hopefully you can see, is essentially showing you the national parks across the UK and hopefully you can see the Pembrokeshire coast which is just in the southwest of that uh, map of Britain. And the, uh, the map on the left just shows you a, a zoomed out, a, a zoomed in version for those of you maybe not so familiar with the area and the National Park area is sort of highlighted in green um, in that one. So, um, so I mentioned that I basically my role focuses on um, archaeological and historical sites uh, and features in the National Park. So hopefully you can just see the extent of heritage in the National Park. So essentially the, the spots uh, in this map represent um, the records uh, relating to scheduled and undesignated monuments, listed and unlisted uh, historical buildings, protected wrecks, uh, locations of artifacts um, and documentary evidence. Um, and the time span for these records, specifically for the Pembrokeshire coast, range from the Upper Paleolithic up to more recent times to include things like the military and anti-invasion defences from uh, the two world wars during the 20th um, century. So the last time I checked, and it does keep uh, increasing, uh, there were over 11,000 records um, uh, that cover the Pembrokeshire coast and you can see it's scattered across it, it pretty much mirrors the the shape of the uh, national park and this will continue to grow with more discoveries and research and of course um, as a planning authority of course uh, some of the research will come out of uh, development led work so while the focus is on the Pembrokeshire coast uh, in the case of uh, this talk um, it's worth mentioning that you would find a similar picture um, if you looked at other parts of uh, Wales in terms of records as well. Um, and we are fortunate uh, in terms of the amount of heritage um, that surrounds us and also in terms of resources to discover more. For example, Archwilio and also uh, things like Covline and Cov Cymru, which you can find um, online. So going back to um, back to focus on Pembrokeshire coast. Um, given the sheer number of um, heritage sites and features that are present, uh, one issue that the National Park faces, unfortunately, is the matter of heritage crime. And one of the, statu the statutory duties of our national park and other national parks is to conserve its special qualities, and that will include the cultural heritage. So safeguarding heritage against crime is an important one for Sorry, the national park. The national park. Um, so the issue has been recognised for some time in the national park, and my colleague and former community archaeologist, Ellen Gibby, uh, recognised this when she set up Heritage Watch, uh, which was done in partnership with the police um, in it, during its initial um, inception. So it was set up as an attempt to try and prevent heritage crime, raise awareness of it, and also encourage um, the public to report it where they identify it. So before I discuss um, heritage, the Heritage Watch scheme further that we have adopted in the Pembrokeshire coast, it's worth highlighting um, for those of you maybe not so familiar, what exactly is heritage crime? And this is the definition that we've developed through this scheme. I'm sure there will be variation. And um, so, you know, it might slightly vary, but hopefully it will generally be uh, similar to the definition you would find um, in law. So essentially, um, heritage crime occurs where unlawful activity harms archaeological and or historical buildings, monuments, 
military crash sites and um, specific landscapes. So the photos that I'm showing here um, are examples of heritage crime in action. So these were taken by one of our heritage volunteers recently, and it's regarding graffiti on a revetment wall um, at Tenby Castle. Um, you'll be pleased to know that the County Council who um, are aware of it, and also the police in Cadu, and they are trying to deal with this issue. And you'll see later on, um, they have attempted to clean off the graffiti. Um, so I'll come on to that in a bit. So heritage crime, will be more strongly recognised in the case of heritage that has been designated. So, for example, a scheduled monument or listed building has strict rules in terms of what you can and can't do, and you have to apply for those. Um, so in, the, in their case, the, the, it'll be much clearer to define heritage crime. However, it can apply in the case of heritage that doesn't have that extra layer of uh, protection. Um, so for example, monuments that are not scheduled um, potentially would also be classed as a heritage crime. Um, the other area that I'm not gonna focus on because uh, generally the National Park is uh, focused on the management of a landscape is um, heritage crime that affects cultural property. Um, so for example, this would be uh, the theft of artifacts, for example, so that, that's one example for you. But I'm, I'm not going to focus on that because that's a very specific area and some other colleagues uh, will be more familiar with that. So that's just to give you a heads up that this is going to be more focused on uh, being site based um, heritage crime. So I mentioned that the Heritage Watch Scheme was uh, set up in 2018. Um, so this is likely to have been set up because of um, issues at sites like Gorse Foud. So I mentioned at the beginning that I've used this lovely uh, image of Gorse Foud. And um, unfortunately, uh, this site has um, been affected by um, heritage crime issues. Um, so Gorse Foud, for those of you who aren't aware, it's a Bronze Age uh, stone circle and it's located in the north of the National Park and it's in the Preseli area. And you can see the Preseli Hills just behind um, that one. Um, so just to go on to the second photo. So this is the specific issue that we had um, at this site, um, specifically burning in the center of the monument. Um, and the burning took place and coincided with uh, pagan festivals, including Beltane, Summer Solstice and Lu Lunasa, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, so you can see the, the results of burning there, it's scorched earth. Um, and this was, actually, uh, this was actually as a result of the summer solstice in uh, 2018. So the damage itself is more aesthetic um, and superficial um, because it's only affecting the top layers of the monument, but is nonetheless a heritage crime because um, this particular uh, site is uh, scheduled. Um, 2018 also experienced um, a heat wave, so it could have uh, increased the risk of uh, wildfires in that particular area. And it's also mentioning that Gorse Foul is within a triple SI area. So, you know, burning can have potential uh, ecological implications as well. So as part of the um, scheme, uh, basically, the National Park worked with the Paris Police uh, and uh, carried out joint patrols to um, Gorse Foud and also to similar sites. Um, and in addition, uh, they did try to work with the local pagan communities to raise the issue of burning uh, within a scheduled monument and the potential um, complications of doing so. Um, and interestingly, I know that Wine Man was already mentioned, but at this time, uh, a similar issue was discovered um, at that site, and that was thanks to those patrols. Um, and I, I was just going to mention that you might be familiar about the uh, documentary um, that was on the BBC Two last year about that site, but that's already uh, been mentioned. So um, one thing that we had to consider as National Park Authority is, of course, uh, for pagans, uh, burning at these kind of sites is an important element of their beliefs and their rituals. So uh, one solution that uh, my colleagues at the time came up with uh, was to create temporary fire pits that could then be used at those sites. So that would allow uh, the worshipping there to take place with the burning, but at the same time it wouldn't cause this kind of um, issue that you can see um, on the screen. Um, so. 
In addition to uh, the temporary pits, the other thing that uh, the National Park did is it obtained consent from CADU to carry out repair on that uh, scorched area. So another site which probably influenced uh, the, uh, the early development of the scheme um, and also uh, brought CADU in as a partner because CADU manages the site is of course the iconic site known as uh, Pentreban, which hopefully many of you will be aware of. It's an iconic one for the National Park because it tends to be used a lot in our publicity when you know, when we're thinking of um, heritage and archaeology. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, it's a Neolithic monument. And also, interestingly, um, some of you will probably be aware, but it was one of the earliest monuments to be scheduled in Britain um, back in 1884. And that was just after the first sort of ancient monument legislation came in. So that sort of that demonstrates that this particular monument has been recognised as uh, of national importance for a very long time. Now, unfortunately, in the case of Pentrivan, um, not everyone seems to appreciate the importance of leaving the monument as it is found. Um, and in 2018, uh, daubing appeared on two of the supporting stones of the capstone. Um, so a heart was drawn on uh, the, one of the central supporting stones, which is um, on the left of this image. And then there was also a Celtic-like symbol uh, was drawn on um, the supporting stone uh, which is on the right side of the image. So I'm just showing you there the um, zoomed in images of the daubing that had taken place. So you can see the heart um, on the left and then you can see the Celtic symbol on the right. I'm sure there's a specific name for that symbol but um, unfortunately I, I'm not familiar what it is. Um, uh, yeah so, so you've got so that gives you an idea um, of what was drawn on them. So the symbols themselves actually are not ugly, um, but they're inappropriately uh, placed. Um, and it's not only affecting the heritage aspect of the monument, but uh, the daubing could also have impacted on lichen that has been growing on the monument uh, for a significant amount of time. So uh, the daubing was done using paint rather than uh, being scratched into the surface of the monument. So fortunately, um, it was removed successfully. So if you went there now, you wouldn't see um, these two images uh, on the monument. Um, but prior to removal, obviously, they wanted to be careful how they carried out the conservation. Um, CADU did test, uh, the conservation team tested uh, what exactly they'd used and interestingly they found that the daubing was done with animal blood so uh, I'll leave you to read into that uh, what you may from that. So um, another element of uh, the uh, Heritage Watch scheme um, was that uh, we did publicise um, the issue and uh, that of course raised public awareness um, and that resulted in uh, the piece being picked up by several media outlets including ITV, the BBC and S4C and this is a snippet of the article that was posted um, on BBC News in October 2018. Unfortunately the, the, the people responsible weren't identified but the case did highlight the issue of heritage crime and also the fact that you know it, it's it's unacceptable that it happens um, on these monuments. So I just wanted to so I've sort of talked about potentially the sites that shaped the um, development of the Heritage Watch scheme, um, but what I wanted to highlight was the four sort of elements I think that are developed as a result of um, the scheme in 2018. Um, so the first one, which is in the top uh, top left, is training. So during that initial phase of development, um, the uh, National Park, in partnership with the police, um, uh, provided training for local neighbourhood policing teams who would probably have to deal with some of these issues. And the type of stuff that was covered was uh, included covering the types of heritage in the National Park area, how to get the information out about heritage, um, what issues were facing uh, the park area, relevant legislation, and also the purpose of the Heritage Watch scheme. 
And then that was followed in early 2019 with training for some uh, community, for some um, national park volunteer wardens, um, essentially to teach them how to access information about heritage, what the legislation is, um, where to report issues, and also um, highlighting which sites are accessible and could be visited um, in terms of keeping an eye on them. And to help with the, the, the volunteers work, um, the National Park provided a fact sheet with all that key information. Um, so this, the second one, um, which is top right, is patrols and visits. So that's another element that developed um, as part of that scheme. So that was done again in partnership between the National Park and um, the police, and it included targeting sites that are known to be at risk and, at, and also targeting sites at risk at particular times of the year. So for example, I mentioned the, um, uh, the summer solstice before, so particular sites might get a visit around um, around that time as well. The other thing that um, they did when they did these patrols is they took flyers with them and that was to publicize um, heritage crime to the public, including how they could report. Um, they also carried out some independent visits um, when they were passing sites, just to check that uh, there were no issues. So just going down to the, um, the bottom right. So another element was publicity and uh, a Facebook page was established um, for Heritage Watch uh, when it was started. And this was really to share updates on the scheme, uh, including activities. It was also about raising public awareness of the issues and encouraging the public to report um, issues and to report in the way they felt comfortable. So initially there was a, uh, you could email um, the National Park archeologist, uh, you could uh, report directly to the police and you could also report via the Facebook page and that could be done by posting or actually anonymously um, by a messaging if you didn't want um, pe people more generally to see what you were reporting. And then the final element, which we've kind of covered already, uh, was conservation work. And that's essentially um, carrying out remedial work where it's possible where the damage has taken place. And um, I've mentioned um, that work was carried out to repair the, the damage that's, that was seen at Gorsfell and also Pentra Ivan. So what I want to do now is, so I've kind of given you a, a snapshot of the development, a uh, bit of cases that sort of uh, influenced the scheme. But now I just want to talk a bit about what's been happening um, since that initial period and up until uh, pretty much the the pretty much now really um, current. So um, since the scheme was established, um, we've continued to deliver and support training for police teams. Um, although uh, I, I would say that um, in more recent times, uh, more people have more organisations have become involved. So it includes now um, ourselves. Dover Paris Police, um, CADU, and also the Dover Dark Lodge Trust when it's been specific for our area. But in February 2020, and this was just before COVID, um, we fortunately managed to deliver an in-person session um, at Mein Klochog, which is in the north, and it's in the Proselli area of the National Park. And that was done with the local police officers, and that was done in partnership with CADU. And this included the basics around what is archaeology, because you know, police officers might not be aware what it is, they pro probably haven't studied it. So it was just to give them that basic framework. And then we, uh, we mentioned uh, designations such as scheduled monuments, uh, what's a heritage crime, and also highlighted some case studies to help them um, get their head around heritage crime a bit easier. Um, the second part of that um, event, we actually uh, took the uh, officers out and they visited some of the sites that have previously been affected by heritage crime. Um, so what you can see here is that session. Um, so the photo on your left on the screen, um, that's just showing uh, the visit to Baird Morris Standing Stone. Um, and that has previously, unfortunately, um, been damaged. Uh, a, there's, there's, as you can see there, there's a road there and previously a vehicle has collided with uh, that monument and hence why you can see those little stones. So those little stones next to the standing stone, they're, they're not archeological, they're there to hopefully create some sort of deterrent um, <laughs> if drivers don't notice the big standing stone. Um, and then the uh, image on the uh, right of your screen, um, that's just a snippet of a joint heritage training event. We uh, 
undertook at a more national level. So initially, that training event was supposed to take place um, in person, but uh, of course, um, COVID hit, and so we adapted it to deliver it virtually. And you can hopefully see all the uh, different organisations that were involved in that training. And again, that was to provide training for police officers at a national level. So we had three of the four police forces represented and officers from there. And um, we had the archaeological trusts. Uh, we had, like I mentioned, the three police forces. Um, we had the three national parks and we had um, CADU and also Historic England who helped um, deliver um, the content for the training. And it was well received. I think we had on the screen about 50 um, attendees. So it's likely that some of the police uh, were uh, watching in, in teams. So it's likely we had significantly more people um, watching. That. And one thing we did with both of these is we, we publicized them on our Facebook page just to show to the public the types of things that we were, we were doing. Um, so uh, sort of, more recently, obviously this happened in 2020, um, we are hoping to deliver a, a sort of um, updated session to police colleagues in David Powys. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we've had to delay that, but we're hoping to deliver a virtual um, event in April. So fingers crossed, COVID won't get in the way of us um, delivering that next one. Um, one thing to mention about both sessions that we've previously delivered in 2020 is that they were well received and I think the police officers found them very useful in terms of uh, carrying out their work in relation to um, heritage crime. So uh, another element that, that we've continued to carry out despite Covid is uh, patrols. So uh, what you can see there is an image of uh, a local PCSO, uh, Karen Phillips, um, on the left, and he's there visiting Baird Morris, the, um, the, 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 the site that the officers visited in the um, previous image, um, and he was uh, there just checking to see um, that there were no issues. Unfortunately, uh, in 20, this was taken in 2020 during the autumn equinox. However, in 2021, he did a revisit, and um, you'll see in a bit, um, he found that somebody had recently etched, they've scratched into the surface of the standing stone, but I, I will come back to that one um, shortly. And then the, um, the other sort of, sort of um, addition to the scheme, although uh, voluntary wardens were previously um, trained, is um, we trained uh, volunteers specifically um, to carry out monitoring uh, visits to scheduled monuments um, and we carried out that training virtually in 2020 and then from September 2020 they started visiting all the accessible publicly accessible scheduled monuments in the national park area and we've got currently 17 volunteers who have been carrying out those visits since September 2020 and um, we've had over 200 visits to scheduled monuments to date although I haven't actually looked at the figures for February so it's probably higher than that um, so you know it's it's thanks to them for their visits um, and as a result of those visits now they were there looking at just issues in general um, at sites however um, uh, they also have picked up some uh, heritage crime issues. Um, so that's helped us paint a big, bigger picture of the issue in the National Park. And then as heritage crime issues have been identified, we've then been able to tailor the patrol response to the site. So for example, um, in some cases, we will ask heritage volunteers if they can visit the site more frequently. Site. And also, and also um, equally, uh, the police will sort of, they'll add um, the sites at risk to their patrols and they'll visit them during their um, shifts. So that just gives you an idea of where we're up to with patrols and how that's carrying on. So um, I mentioned the Facebook page that was developed in 2018. So that is still there, but um, what we did in 2020 is we revamped it um, and we updated it. And uh, obviously, the purpose of that Facebook page is to engage with the public and um, a wider audience as well. And it, it's quite, it has been successful. I'll, I'll show you some stats um, in, in the next uh, few slides. Um, but essentially we updated it and obviously the Dark Cultural Trust is now a partner organization to the scheme. So we updated um, that and obviously some of the information on there as well. And then the bottom page on the screen 
is a screenshot uh, from our National Park uh, web page of the scheme. And we developed this in 2020. Um, and we did this in partnership with um, CADU, David Pass Police and the David Archaeological Trust. So the purpose of the web page is uh, essentially to provide visitors with almost the static information, the information that doesn't change about, um, you know, heritage crime. And it also provides information about how to report issues. Whereas the, the Facebook page, which is that top image or the screenshots, is essentially, it's, it's more dynamic. So um, we will update it uh, regarding what activities are happening, um, ongoing cases, and you know other aspects like for example if we're delivering uh, training sessions we will put that on there so people can see what we're doing so that's a bit more of a dynamic um, uh, format to engage so um, hopefully you can see the two screenshots and these are uh, posts that i put on um, facebook in 2021 um, the first one on your left uh, is about uh, camp style fires at one of our national park sites and the second one is around off-roading and it's again to highlight when these issues occur and also uh, as a way to keep it in uh, people's mind um, so that if they see these kind of issues um, at heritage sites uh, they will hopefully report them to um, the relevant uh, organizations um, and hopefully the other thing you can see uh, hopefully perhaps the 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 writing's a bit small but hopefully you can see it is you can see the sort of number of people being reached by these posts so you can see that one on the left um over well almost 32,000 people saw the uh, english post and one thing i should mention on the facebook page we will post both in english and welsh so this is specifically the English post, but we will also have a Welsh one. And even uh, the, the Welsh posts also get quite high engagement. Obviously, the numbers are slightly lower because obviously uh, less people are able to um, speak Welsh, but the engagement is also high with that. Um, and one of the ways we've managed to increase our engagement and the number that um, these posts reach is by uh, sharing the post with partners, so CADU, David Paris Police, and if there's something specific, so for example, this post about the fire at one of our sites, we also linked in with um, the fire service for our area and also uh, Natural Resources Wales because the specific site here is a triple SI. So that all helps us increase that engagement as well. So um, just to sort of show you the type of um, media coverage we've had uh, in the last few years. So again, uh, we've had some uh, national coverage. So you can see here um, uh, the, some articles on the BBC News. Uh, we also did, uh, we've done some TV and radio interviews. So we did uh, an interview back in just before COVID actually, we did a Radio Wales country focus um, piece and we were interviewed about heritage crime. Unfortunately, they did uh, do a television piece, but due to COVID, um, unfortunately the attention of the media sort of shifted so unfortunately they didn't have the time to actually um, broadcast that particular episode which was a real shame and then finally uh, more recently in uh, October 2021 uh, I posted something on the Facebook page and the Western Telegraph which is a local paper in uh, Pembrokeshire picked it up and put it on their um, website and that relates to um, damage at two sites um, as a result of heritage crime. So hopefully that just shows you. And the other thing to mention is that um, the these show how effective uh, the different approaches to publicity or publicizing work. So um, some of this was picked up through the Facebook page and some of it was picked up through press releases. So it just shows that using different means of publicizing really does help in terms of getting the message out. So. Um, what I wanted to sort of highlight is some examples. So hopefully you can see uh, six examples of the types of issues we've encountered or we've um, identified um, since we've been running Heritage uh, Watch. Although a lot of these we will have been aware of um, 
prior to the scheme. So since, uh, since the scheme was established, we've had almost 30 cases of heritage crime um, in the national park area. And we have a database where we log all the crimes that are coming in. And fortunately, those are coming in from people reporting to the to us at the National Park, people reporting to David Paris Police, and also people reporting to CADU and the David Archaeological Trust. So we have quite a good way of um, being kept informed about what's happening and if things are coming to different organisations. Um, so I would say that we've identified them uh, the issues because of the mixture of patrols from the National Park, um, and that's from police and other colleagues, and also from our heritage volunteers, as I mentioned. And also, additionally, and this will probably prove the success of the Facebook page, we've also had some reports via the Facebook page um, about issues as well. And then we've tried to then, of course, address the issues that have been raised. So I think without the scheme, our indication of the issues and where to allocate and focus resources would be significantly reduced. Um, you might be thinking 30 doesn't sound like a lot uh, over since 2018, but if you imagine um, that's of the ones we know, there probably is more. And also, if, if you kind of looked at it at a national level, you know, the, the figure would be significantly higher. So it is quite concerning um, that we're getting these um, issues. Um, so on the screen, um, I've put some examples of the type of um, issues that have come through. So I'm just gonna quickly run through them so you know what you're looking at. So uh, in the top left, uh, this is a this was a, a camp style fire, which is uh, which was in the center of a hut circle um, at St. David's Head ca uh, Camp. So that's near St. David's. Um, and then at the top middle, um, this is actually a very, um, this is a, unfortunately, it's a typical issue we have with um, cairns, um, but this is an example from Boilera's Bronze Age cairn, which is um, on top of the Priscelli Hills, and hopefully you can make out the disturbance. So uh, essentially you can see the lichen, which is the white, and then you can see this very grey area, and that's where um, visitors um, have been basically moving the um, the stones uh, essentially, and that could that's probably because some people will not be aware, or they might not have, or they might not have archaeological background to understand that actually these are protected scheduled areas. But that's a typical issue that we um, we face. And then um, the the final one, top right, is another burning example. So this is a, a um, camp style fire um, that uh, has been occurring on Carningley Camp, which is just above uh, Newport, Pembrokeshire. And then sort of the bottom row, um, what we've got here is the first one, is a zoomed in uh, photo of ground poaching or um, unauthorized metal detecting. So essentially they've, they've been metal detecting at the site and then they've, they've obviously um, cut away a bit of the turf to see um, what they've found. So that is at a site called Bether Avanc Burial Chamber. Um, and that's a Neolithic site. Um, so that one came through actually through Facebook. So that was actually uh, picked up thanks to a member of the public who made us aware. Um, and it's unauthorized because the site is scheduled. So um, this is a, an example of what they call night hawking is another term um, where unauthorized metal detecting takes place. And then the middle one, which I've already highlighted is uh, graffiti. Um, at uh, Tenby Castle, so that's on the Retman Wall, um, and it is an issue that has, unfortunately, they've been experiencing in Tenby recently. So this isn't the only graffiti they've um, found um, in that town. Um, and then sort of the last one is uh, what I mentioned. So I mentioned that Baird Morris recently suffered um, someone etching or scratching into the surface of the standing stone. Um, I don't know how clear it is, but Hopefully you can just about make out some scratches there um, on that one as well. So those are just some examples. Of course, there's, there's other types of uh, issues that we're facing, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the ones that have come through. So um, one of the things that we have continued uh, 
to carry out is where we can is conservation work. Um, and we mentioned Gorse Fowl and Pentry Van Land that we carried out some work um, there in 2018 to try and uh, remedy the issues there. Um, and it's also the case that we will continue to try to do that where issues are identified and where it is possible to uh, address issues. So I just mentioned now the etched or the scratched graffiti uh, that's been scratched into the um, surface of uh, the Baird Morris Standing Stone. Unfortunately, because it's been scratched in, it's very difficult for us to actually carry out work to remove that. Um, so the, what we can do there is we can increase patrols and hopefully um, we won't see um, you know, the same issue again. Um, but it's essentially a case of uh, letting, um, you know, letting the site weather over time. Um, so it, it is unfortunate in some cases, we, we, we're not able to actually um, do anything other than just monitor and hope the same issue does not happen again. So we, we try to increase patrols in that case. Um, but in other cases, we do try to carry out um, work. So a good example would be graffiti for this. Um, however, removal can leave a shadow or what is known as ghosting. And uh, the example in the uh, top left is of that graffiti that I showed you um, between the benches at uh, the revetment wall. And you can see Tempe Castle just in the background or just at the top of that image. Um, essentially, the council have tried to remove the graffiti by cleaning it recently, but unfortunately it has left a bit of a trace, but hopefully, as it weathers and also potentially hopefully as the lichen uh, grows back it will hopefully um, cover the graffiti that you can currently see there. So another example is in the bottom left and this is um, at St Gobbins Chapel. So we had some graffiti here last year and essentially uh, because the, the rock surface is rough, it's not smooth, um, we were basically able to clear that graffiti quite well. So it's blended in. So people who visit that site won't be aware that that uh, a particular surface of that site has been graffiti. And I've chosen this image selectively because if you go there, you hopefully won't know where the graffiti was either. Um, and uh, this particular graffiti, I have to uh, be uh, grateful to our area ranger, um, for this particular area, they took over two hours using the graffiti um, stuff we used uh, with a toothbrush. So they really did try their best to remove as much as they can. But fortunately, like I say, it's quite a rough surface, so it's harder to see in this case. And then um, just going on to the top left, um, this is uh, another unauthorised metal detecting that took place at St. Patrick's Chapel at White Sands, which isn't far from St. David's. Now, fortunately, um, we have recently excavated at the site, and it was that particular area was that was um, that they were hoping to find something. Unfortunately, the the deposits are deep, so they wouldn't have been able to get to the buried archaeological um, layers. Um, however, they did leave holes, and um, what you're seeing there is the infill that our wardens put in. So this particular site is right by the beach. So it's pretty much sand. So what they've done is they've infilled with sand. We did consult with CADU, of course, to get the consent and also with NRW for the triple SI consent for that particular site. But hopefully what will happen now is the turf will uh, regenerate and eventually you won't notice um, that particular hole. And then the final one, which I've kind of covered already, is this issue of people rearranging uh, Bronze Age cairns. So this is actually a, a part of the cairns that you find at um, Foyle Drugan, which is again in the Priscelli. Um, and you can hopefully see that people have been building a sort of depression. Um, now this, I've sort of cheated here because this actually was taken from 2012, but I just felt this particular image just really showed in detail um, that. So in terms of conservation, it's something that we definitely should try and keep on top of, but unfortunately something we just have to keep um, maintaining and again, do the publicity. Um, but this particular one was repaired, but we're starting to see the same issue appear. And I think it goes back to the fact that, you know, potentially some of the visitors are not aware that the sites are scheduled. And that could be because they 
they maybe don't have an interest in archaeology heritage or they haven't got the archaeological background to spot um, you know, th this particular issue. But there are several sites um, with cairns that are being affected this way and we are hoping um, with consent from CADA we can actually carry out some uh, work at those sites. So just finally, some additions from that um, initial period when we established. So initially it was um, just uh, David Powers Police and the National Park that were involved with the scheme. And of course, when the damage happened at Pentryvan, uh, CADU shortly uh, came on board. But more recently, um, the David Archaeological Trust has, has also um, joined the scheme and is, is contributing to it. And what that means is whilst uh, the National Park covers the National Park area, um, the inclusion of the David Archaeological Trust means that now we can also include uh, the Pembrokeshire more widely, but also Ceredigion and Carmarthenshire, which made up the old uh, county of Dyved. Um, now, as part of uh, our partnership, one thing we do do now is we have regular meetings. And of course, because of COVID, this happens virtually and actually um, undertaking those meetings virtually has made it easier for us to have that regular catch-ups because you don't have to travel to a particular area. And what we tend to discuss at those meetings is we discuss active cases, how to deal with them, we share ideas, what can we do to address um, particular issues. We talk about potential training needs and planning for training events, uh, publicity, and any other matters that are relevant to um, the Heritage Watch group. So we are hoping, and it's something that we're looking at, um, to sort of broaden out the Heritage Watch scheme to cover David Powys, um, the David Powys area. So we are hoping that um, we will be able to uh, get support from our colleagues in Powys, and that way that will mirror the area that the police force covers as well. So hopefully you found this presentation useful uh, with regards to heritage crime and also how the national park in collaboration with uh, partner organizations is trying to address the issues that um, we're identifying as best as possible um, i think the scheme is a good example of how to work collaboratively and also as a way to engage um, with uh, and communicate with the public on the um, on the issue. So the National Park's perception of heritage crime has also definitely improved as a result of the scheme. So I've put a few links um, in the on the screen, hopefully you can see, and I've left Gorse Bow there so you can still see that uh, lovely site. So the first link will take you to our web page. I will try and post these in the uh, chats function and hopefully uh, my colleagues at CPAC can share this with you if they have your email after um, the talk. The second one is the link to the Facebook page so that will give you some information about upcoming things. Sometimes we don't update it for a few months, it just depends uh, whether there's issues that have arisen or not. And then finally, the last one is the general um, Pembrokeshire Coast archaeology mailing list. And if you're interested in finding out other things that we're doing, so excavations, activities and events, guided walks, talks, uh, the Archaeology Day, which we hold every November, um, it's worth clicking on that link and signing up. And then you will find we will basically uh, let you know when things that you're interested in are happening.